It's my pleasure to welcome you here to, to MOCAD today um, for the talk the, with the artist and the founder of Little Libraries. Um, this talk is part of an ongoing series um, that MOCAD has embarked on um, called Art as Social Force. Um, it's a multi-year examination of artists who seek to establish participatory and socially transformative art. Known primarily as social practice, its practitioners freely blur the lines among art making, performance, political activism, community organizing, environmentalism, and investigative journalism, creating a deeply participatory art that often flourishes outside the gallery and museum system. So I think this, this qualifies for that definition, absolutely. Um, I'd like to introduce to you Kim Kozlowski. She's the founder of Detroit Little Libraries, uh, a grassroots campaign to promote reading, community, and access to books in Detroit through the Free Little Library Global Movement. Kim is also a reporter on higher education for the Detroit News. Um, for Kim, uh, the library campaign is her civic project. She uh, started Detroit Little Free Library campaign in September of 2000. 14, with the goal of making Detroit, little free libra Detroit the free little library capital of the world. Um, since November, she's installed dozens of free little libraries throughout Detroit in front of individual homes, nonprofit organizations, faith-based institutions, small businesses, community farms and gardens, healthcare centers, and city parks. Um, please join me in welcoming Kim. <laughs> Hello. Thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate um, your coming to visit. After the talk today, I'd like to invite you all over to the mobile homestead, and that's where you'll see um, the little free libraries that have been transformed by these artists here today. So I want to start here and um, read you a little something. Um, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a cracked in everything. That's how the light gets in. That's how the light gets in. Um, um, we have had so many people who've wanted to get involved, from the Kiwanis to the Rotary. First United Methodist Church in Birmingham has been involved, Detroit Soup. A lot of Eagle Scouts have come forward and wanted to embrace this as their project. We recently started working with a family who had their bar and bats mitzvah for their children, and they raised money. And it's just a very joyful thing to be involved in to um, give away books. People have books; they want to, you know, they want to give away books. So last year, um, we asked some artists if they would put their artwork on some blank little free libraries, and we created the exhibition that is over in the mobile homestead. Um, it became a traveling exhibition, and it's here for the next three months, and so we're going to talk to them today about what they've been doing, and um, at some point, if you all have questions, um, we're going to have a Q&A, too. So, thank you for coming. I'd like to introduce to you our panel of artists. We have Barbara Bearfield, Kelly O'Hara, and Obisi Okoyo. Race, oh, Ina Leger, and Deborah Grace. These are our artists here today. And let's open up the conversation here today um, by talking about a little bit about your background and um, briefly what inspired you to get involved in this movement. Thank you, Kim. I would have to say that Kim inspired me to get into this movement because she called me up and started telling me about this great idea she had to put libraries around the city and asked if I had any ideas where we could put them. And of course, I immediately said Palmer Park because my heart and soul has been devoted to revitalizing that park over the last six years and over the last uh, 30, 40 years that I've lived in that area, and also in Palmer Woods. So I have one in front of my home, and I have one that we help maintain in Palmer Park, except that one is always empty of books, no matter how many times a day we put books in there, it seems to disappear. So the idea of trying to make books very accessible to families, to um, people of all ages, and especially children who often don't have that opportunity to have a real book in their hands 
on a regular basis to keep being able to go somewhere where they can reach and pull that book out um, and maybe even walk to that location is, is just such a fabulous idea in a city that really needs that boost to encourage and support readership. Um, I started reading to my kids when, as soon as they came out of as soon as they came out of me, pretty much, you know, as soon as I was able to sit in the rocking chair and start reading to them. And I think that's how we foster language. That's how we foster the development of um, creativity and, and thinking and, and wonderful human beings. So, should I pass it on? Oh, oh we're good. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Hi, I'm Kelly. Uh, yep, Kim also wrangled me into this. I had a couple days to get this done. It was a great way to give back. Um, I grew up in a community where I had multiple libraries within a short walking distance, very good libraries. So for me, it was a good chance to kind of get it out there so little ones could read or, you know, people who don't have the opportunity. In Detroit, we don't have very many libraries. They are kind of far and few between. So for us to be able to place them around the city and make it more accessible for everyday people, for everyone, it was, it was a good opportunity to give back. So absolutely, I said yes in a heartbeat. And in two days, you had a library. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Yep. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew B. Sequoia. Um, I didn't follow the typical route. Um, a friend of mine, um, Matt Eaton, encouraged me to be a part of the project. When he explained to me what Detroit Little Libraries was about, I was all for it, um, especially because of the literacy rate in Detroit is so low. Um, any opportunity I get to give back or to encourage literacy or creativity through any means possible, I definitely want to be a part of that. So um, I was very happy to be a part of this project. So, yeah. 47% of adults in Detroit are functionally illiterate. Um, I'd like to think that collectively we could do something about that. Um, when uh, Kim reached out, uh, what really jumped out at me was uh, she said, well, you know, there's these uh, newspaper boxes that are collecting dust and cobwebs uh, up in Sterling Heights, and they would probably make really cool little libraries. And um, in a lot of ways, everything and everybody seems to be throwaway in Detroit. And there's a long history of artists uh, using found materials to uh, repurpose and reuse. So having the opportunity to um, decorate a newspaper box and actually a Detroit news box after having worked there for a lot of years was actually an honor. So uh, I was all about it. Thank you, you know. Um, I'm Deborah Grace and I became involved when Eno invited me and I'm acquainted with Kim also because I had worked at the paper a number of years ago and I just I couldn't think of a better way to be able to help give back to Detroit and build Detroit up because it's used to receiving enough punches in the face and enough black eyes and there just are a shortage of opportunities to really really build people up here and really show them the hope and the opportunity that's right in front of them. And there's no better way of doing that than with a book. Um, when I was a child, I didn't read books. My mother said I ate books because I just loved to read, 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 read. And as an adult, I'm 53, so I really, with kids that are between 12 and 30, I haven't had a whole lot of time to read a whole lot the way that I used to eat books before. But as with Barbara, from the time my kids were on their way out, and from the time they were able to sit on my lap, I probably read to them, I would say I read to them voraciously. Um, and I was hoping something would take hold, because for me, a book is a world, and with all of the books that I ate, it was like, um, it was like swallowing universes, not even a universe, universes. And when you put a book in someone's hand, you are giving them so many things that I know we're gonna be talking about as we go around here on the panel but putting a book in the hand of anyone here in the city is putting hope in their hand, is, is putting a world in the, in the palm of their hands, is giving them hope, is giving them ideas and inspiration that those 
the reason that books change lives is because knowledge changes lives. And knowledge changes lives as well as inspiration. And all those things can be found in the pages of a book. There are a few things that are more transforming than the arts and the literary arts are king. Thank you, Deborah. Um, one of the things we have been doing, we have put up about 150 throughout the community. And they're in a, a diverse number of places. Uh, one of our biggest challenges is to get into communities where they are really needed. Um, so we can bring hope to them. Um, could you talk a little bit, um, any of you, um, about how we can get into neighborhoods where, um, where books, of course books are needed everywhere, but really deeper into neighborhoods where um, we can spread more books in the community? Yeah. I mean, I've, I chose um, for my location, for my lab library, uh, Studio 2, down on Alter Road. I have a friend who owns the studio, and he works close, hand in hand, with the local children. They're trying to give them more opportunities with art. Um, so I decided to partner with him. He loved the idea to place one right there in front of his studio so that the kids not only had an opportunity to come learn about art, but then they could take books and read as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful idea, Kelly, to, to partner with a center or a space where we know children go to regularly. Mm -hmm. So I think that puts a spark in all of our minds to let Kit, Kim know if, um, if such a space, even if you don't live in that neighborhood, but if you know someone who does or you know someone who's involved in some kind of group activity or group space, um, to let her know that that would be a good public space where children often come together. One of the things you had mentioned, Barbara, um, there is a library in Palmer Park, and it always needs books. In fact, there are many locations in the community um, where the model of the Little Free Library is take a book, leave a book. Um, the leave a book model doesn't always work, and our guess is that people are building their libraries at home. I'm wondering what, what your thoughts were about how why you think the model isn't working, but how we can you know, continue to get books into the libraries and maybe get the library model to work. Well, in the case of Palmer Park, I think you're probably right, Kim, that these may be folks that maybe don't have books and, and they're really treasures to have, so they don't necessarily have a book to put back, or they're in public spaces and they haven't brought a book because they maybe never saw the, the, the little library before, so they didn't know the system of bringing a book and leaving a book. So I guess it, we need to supplement it. Everybody who um, thinks of it and can drive to those spaces or walk to or bike to those spaces tries to bring extra books, you know, five instead of one or 20 instead of one. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, spreading the word. So many people have basements full of books that they don't touch. So many people read on tablets now, you know, who can afford that? They have, I, I myself have a garage full of books that my mother-in-law is having me keep right now. I'm hoping she'll let me let them go, and we're going to bring them right to you. So as soon as I get her permission, you'll have a ton more. Thank you. One of my thoughts is that it probably would be a great idea to see if we can take field trips to public schools and go into public schools. And some of them can come to us on field trips and come to the mobile homestead and come to MOCAD, but it would be great to take a box or two to a public school and just set it in front of a classroom and have children come up and investigate it just out of curiosity. And curiosity is usually the catalyst for opening a book in the first place and just showing them how you can connect art and reading and having students take books out and see what happens, what kind of a, in, their, in their classroom communities, and that they help spread the word when they go home to their parents and to their friends and start asking you know, when they can see little libraries popping up in their neighborhood. So educating classrooms and schools in the community one by one is another way of getting your libraries out and getting your creativity out and sharing books and yourself, parts of yourself with others in and around Detroit schools. I definitely agree with that idea. Um, that's why I picked the location I picked, my alma mater, uh, Cass Tech um, downtown. Um, the, as much as we 
don't want to admit it, the kids create culture and they um, make things popular and they get word, the word out faster than we ever could. Social media or whatever um, trend is going right now. Um, so I thought putting my library there would give it a boost like locally. Um, they could tell their friends, the friends could tell other friends on social media. I think it would be like a grassroots effort to spread the word out. That's what will mostly get kids to put more books in the libraries if they know about it. So I think that's a great idea. There's a word you don't hear often unless you uh, maybe show up at church regularly. And that word is stewardship. Um, part of, I believe, keeping little libraries full. Um, putting the doors back on when they get ripped off. Uh, like I guess what happened in Hamtramck with a little library requires somebody uh, or somebody's to make the commitment um, to, to be good stewards of what's been started. And, and that's not an easy task. It's, it's really difficult to maintain a project like that unless you have a lot of passion. So it, it requires people with passion. It requires people with the stay with it kind of attitude. Um, over the last couple of years, I've been working pretty close with Recycle here over on Holden Street. And um, more than a year ago, they had a little library. And it was in uh, the Lincoln Street Art Park. And when this started to happen, it, I recall that, you know, oh, there was a little library in the art park. So um, I reached out to Matt and Amy, who runs the art park and said, hey, you know, what, ha what happened to the little library? And he said, well, you know, we put it there and actually a lot of books come into the recycle center and they kept it stocked, but um, the weather, the elements, and he said, you know, we had a lot of things going on here and that became less of a priority. And he said, well, okay, but now that we have a shipping container classroom, maybe it's time to uh, jumpstart a little library over there. So whoever it is, there needs to be that um, stewardship. That's really kind of an essential part of all this. Yes, right, you're right. Stewardship is very important in, the, in taking care of the little libraries. We are working with most of um, the libraries. They do have a steward, but sometimes they don't. Um, one of the things we did try was an experiment here. We put some in parks. And sadly, a few of them didn't make it. Uh, in fact, we heard one story about how one was actually set on fire. Um, but um, what's been really um, wonderful, there, uh, a community off of Eight Mile, Community United for Progress, they had a situation where there was a vandalism incident in Dad Butler Park, but the stewards there, they called me out and they said, we didn't want to bother you. We wanted to take care of this on our own and we have taken care of this. And so that's, I think, the passion that you were talking about, Ray. And one of the things we're now doing as an experiment is we are putting retired newspaper bins in the parks. Those are less destructible. And that's what you'll see over at the exhibition. There are a few of the um, retired newspaper bins from the Detroit News and Free Press that were donated to some of the artists to transform them. So, so speaking of art that's over at the Mobile Homestead, um, let's talk with all of the artists about their specific library. If they could describe it a little bit for us, maybe their inspiration for it. Um, so when people go over there, you can kind of track the library with the artists. Maybe we could start down over with Deborah. Could you start for us? And if you brought anything that may have inspired you, let us know. Well, I, unfortunately, I didn't, think, didn't have my thinking cap on this morning. I didn't bring a picture of the library. But it's, it's, a, it's, very, it's pretty plain. It's very simple, kind of like a, a bumblebee color theme. It's yellow with black print on it. So you can't miss it because it's one of the first ones you see when you walk in the homestead. But to be truthful, um, when I received the box, I was finishing, I should say, 
in the throes of student teaching <laughs> and I had assignments to do and prepping and grading at night and teaching to do in the day. So I was very pressed and the box got relegated to a weekend <laughs> and so I had to be practical. It was predominantly yellow and I'm very color and line driven so I wanted to find a color that was complementary and I just added to the yellow and um, I, I was I was wanting to keep it simple because of my time constraints. I wanted to communicate effectively with the little time that I had, and I thought that um, I should look for images that I could stencil, so these are stenciled with enamel paint, that just basically said reading is where it's at. So I found the images that, I, that resonated with me that communicated that, and then um, I think most of the artists here decided to inspire the viewer and I kind of took a detour and started preaching to the viewer. So I put words all over the box that basically said, readings where is, at, is where it's at and here's why. So it's kind of like a word sprawl in my case more than art per se. But um, um, I think it adequately enough communicates that I think reading is important. Um, I wanted to appeal to the people in the local community here who often don't make a connection between the written word and changing the changing of their lives, that the written word has been an inspiration for almost anything that's made a difference in people's lives. Whether it's a song that you like that has lyrics, lyrics or written word, a poem that's inspired you, or a movie that you really dig. A movie comes from a screenplay. Screenplay is a written word. It all starts with a written word. If you're a person of faith, it starts with a word. In the beginning was the word, and the word is powerful. So I just wanted to communicate that with words themselves. So there's more word on my box than there is, I think, art. Um, if I may bring, I brought samples of what I normally do, but I don't I don't have a way to blow them up, but I mean, normally I don't work with metal unless they're small pieces um, like jewelry. This is just a blow up of a really tiny thing. You can tell how small it is because it sits in the center of a flower. So usually if I'm doing jewelry, um, that's when I'm working with metal. Normally I do work with wood and when I heard um, Little Library, I was excited because I like to use paper and paint and wood, but we, got, we have the, the metal newspaper boxes. So. I um, normally, if I'm working with wood, I end up with something like this because for whatever odd reason, I have a Jones for bird houses and bright colors. So it's a different kind of a house from a little library, but this is more what I would normally do, crosses and bird houses. If I had had more time, and I hope that I get to do more little libraries, I really want to go to town and put a lot of color on them. I normally do something like this. But I really wanted to communicate in very plain and simple bumblebee uh, color theme basically yeah. that reading is the most is the biggest game changer and the cheapest most inexpensive way to get the biggest payout on your life um, it I, I think on the front of the box I have names of people who um, basically are associated with first in history, the first African American to get a PhD from Harvard, the first this, the first that. I wanted people in the community to see how knowledge changes lives. And I wanted them to make the connection, I want people to make the connection, connect the dots that, to see that, that those people got where they were through a lot, I guess a lot of things conspire to get them to the, the apex that they reached, but part of that, um, part of the, some of the resources, if not maybe a large part of the resources that pushed them to the, the heights of greatness that they reached came through the written word, came through study, came through books, came through knowledge. And again, books change lives because they inspire us or they give us knowledge, and it's the inspiration and the knowledge that changes the lives in you know in turn so thank you that's where Deborah. I went thank you so Deborah's is the yellow retired newspaper bins with a lot of inspirational words you'll see over at the mobile homestead you know okay when you spend 35 years in newspapers you're pretty much driven by words and pictures I don't know that I have much to say about my box uh, I mean okay so there's this orangish red rectangle that I can screw around with and um, since I make stencils uh, I figured okay let's see um, how I can violate 
this rectangle in interesting ways. And there's a narrative there. Um, the only thing I'll really say is the, the biggest image is on the back, and it's a portrait. It's a portrait of Malcolm Little. Uh, it's him when he was like 18 years old. He was about to go into uh, prison for eight years, and he came out the other side as Malcolm X. Um, there's other narratives on there, but... Uh, Tell us about the I 12 that, jewels. I guess I'm an artist because I don't know that I can tell the story as much as just try and draw it. But you have 12 jewels on your... Oh, yeah. Well, okay, 12 jewels. So... Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I have to interrupt Eno because whenever we go places together, and we're often together for reasons only a few people here know, that the, the focus, what drew him to Malcolm, if I'm, and you can t correct me if I'm wrong, is the transformation that took place in his life. And the transformation wasn't as much the transformation that took place in the eight years in prison, but the transformation towards the end of his life, which unfortunately cost him his life, correct? Yeah. And, but all of these things came from experiences that started with this, the yes. written word. That so. would be true. Okay, so 12 Jewels, 1997, New York City, uh, the Riza. Um, he, he put together uh, a group of rappers and they did an album called The Pick, The Sickle, and The Shovel. One of the songs on there is The Twelve Jewels. Um, some of the words that are scribbled on that box are, are actually from that song. The Twelve Jewels are the Twelve Jewels of Islam, which um, when you go out there and look, um, there's twelve diamonds on the box and under each diamond is a word and each of those words is one of the 12 jewels that are important uh, to figure out how to have a life. So, Like justice was one of the words I seem to recall. Justice was one of the words, correct? Yeah. Justice, hope, food, love, knowledge, I think. Yeah, they need, to come, they need to come in order. And so if you haven't been out there, Read the freaking box. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ina. Um, so my box is, isn't that deep. Um, I don't necessarily think of myself as a deep person or a deep thought person. Um, it, my box is like radically different from what I usually do. I usually work in 2D space, um, mostly black and blue. Um, but my box is like pink, red, blue, and it has like white on it. Um, I just wanted to do something more contemporary and more like exciting than what I usually do. Um, I also started my art, I guess career, I guess you could say, uh, with words. Um, I used to like doing a lot of graffiti, not illegally. Uh, I used to just like, like writing words out, it was just fun. Um, so on the front of my box, it was a message that my fiance gave to me, which was keep dreaming, um, which was a message I was giving to her. Um, and I think it was fitting for the box because I think with reading and with literacy, you can go anywhere that your dreams want to take you. Um, I think that's pretty powerful, so, yeah. Can you describe um, the colors you used in yours so people can make the connection between you and your library? Oh, it's uh, pink, blue. On the inside is red and blue, I want to say, um, with the white writing on the front of it. Thank you. And Dovesi, Kelly? Uh, my box is the uh, cityscape box. It's um, predominantly orange and blue with a uh, black city cityscape, and it's got children dancing on the rooftops, which at first doesn't seem to have anything to do with literacy at all, except that um, I do work or have started working in the comic realm and have been slowly building a sequential comic piece. Um, hopefully one day it if it comes to light, it'll find its way into a little library. So what I brought today was my work that I've been working on for, this was for the past year building up to the library. So it goes right along with it. And these are just some of my gallery images um, that I've worked with to put the piece together sequentially. Um, a lot of it is 
to paper at this point, but it hasn't been inked and painted. If I knew ahead of time, I, I would have probably put one of the pages together to bring. But this is a pretty good representation. Um, pieces from five by seven inches to four feet by eight feet. Um, so if you go over to the homestead, you'll find my piece. It's very similar and ties right in with this story that I've been working on for the last year. So go check them out. Uh, I had a very short time to do my piece, but so I basically stayed up all night and worked like two days straight to do it, but it was a really thrilling opportunity. Um, I wanted to do something very magical for, because for me, reading, like Deborah was explaining, it takes you on a journey through many universes, and I wanted to um, reflect the magic that reading meant for me both as a child and for sharing reading with my children and also as an adult because I still read every single day. So um, I started with a hummingbird drinking nectar out of a flower and I wrote there, uh, reading is sweet because reading is one of the sweetest, most wonderful things to me in life. And then I came around the sides and um, I almost felt like there was a blank canvas and what am I gonna do? Because usually I work on the computer with photography, with graphic design work, and um, with clay and ceramic, and I hadn't really painted or um, painted in a long time. So I pulled out a lot of dry paints and cleaned up my paint brushes and, and got into it. Um, and so my other two sides, one side is a mermaid and reading a book, and the other side is a, an angel reading a book, and then the front is a big flower. So I think that describes it so you can find it. And I didn't bring any examples of my ceramic work. Um, what I brought, to me, being an artist um, means giving back to the community. So I use my photography and my skills as a graphic designer to, um, and an organizer to do both musical events in the community and, um, and community events at Palmer Park. We're having a winter fest and doggy festival next weekend on Sunday. So there are cards you can pick up. And I did the photography and design for that. And I also put on jazz, classical, and world music in historic homes in Palmer Woods. And there's some brochures that show the concert series that I, I helped to produce. So um, music, art, um, written word, reading, to me, these are the spirit and life of a civilized, of a culture, of a, a community, and will help elevate all of us and help to bring our the next generation up to be creative and imaginative and wonderful people that I hope will help solve the problems that they're being stuck with right now from the older generations. So I just want to make a little side comment. When these artists did agree to put their artwork on the Little Free Live, we've been very creative in how this um, all happened. Originally, we were working with an Eagle Scout who was going to build the libraries, and I was going to pass them on to these artists. Well, he called me like the day before and said, oh, you know what? Um, things didn't really work out, and we're not building this weekend. I was like, what? <laughs> I told the whole world that we, this was going to happen, and the founder of the movement actually ended up shipping out the libraries um, very generously to all these artists, and that's how most of these, almost all of them got um, created. So yeah, My yeah. library was still wet when I came oh, yeah. running yeah. at 5 o'clock in the time. afternoon yeah. to yeah. put it on the pedestal mm -hmm. yeah. at our first So they really, so much for coming. Thank you to the artists who participate in this.